I've been giving this talk around parts of the state of Oregon, and I was always hoping that I could get into the Giuseppe this fall, um, and this has actually worked very well to my advantage and to yours. And it just happens to be that it's coming on the heels of a very difficult week for a lot of people um, in this county, in this nation, and to think about uh, the right to vote and women's suffrage, I think, is an important topic to bring up at this time. Um, what I might mention um, is this woman here, Abigail Scott Dunaway, um, spent 50 years of her life um, getting the vote in Oregon. And actually, that's, you know, it started when she was relatively young, and, you know, by the time she was in her 80s, or just turned 80, we got the vote in 1912. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, and there is a quote that I think you might be sitting on or holding on to. Would anybody like to just read that? I, I've gotten that out to a lot of people this week because I felt that it's been a hard time, and yet Abigail nailed it. <laughs> so, um, if somebody could read that, David, do you have this moment? Uh, do not yield to difficulties that rise above discouragement. Everything in its day is the order of creation. Success will seldom come in the ways that one has planned for it. But come it will, sooner or later, to all who are faithful. Thank you. Okay. So, I'll talk a moment about my interest in this. Um, I was interested in following the career and work of Abigail Scott Dunaway, uh, you know, around the Northwest, and particularly emphasizing Oregon. But, but most recently with this grant, this small grant, I was able to find out a little bit about what happened in Eastern Oregon and if she even got here. So I'll be talking about that a little later. But my long-standing interest has been in the equality of women and men. Yes, I was part of a community action agency in the state of Washington, and of course, a lot of our activities centered on, on women and men, but women and children. And so uh, this just sort of fit together with my life. Um, this is funded by, as, as, as Rich said, a small Wallawa County Cultural Trust grant. Um, I'd also like to give thanks to my Some time. people in the back would like to see your face. Oh, well, I have to move. Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, you have to do that because otherwise. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 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 Most of my life I'm told. <laughs> okay. Thanks to Anne Hayes, Diane Turner, and most recently, Joe Bowman. We had a wonderful conversation. We're going to get together for tea in another week. Um, she has all the records of the cemeteries still, and she has passed on the obits, but she still has the records, so she was very helpful. Um, Wallawa County Historical Society, Oregon Historical Society, and their family archives, which is on the second floor of that building. If you've never been there and want to know about your family, it's a, it's a real treasure trove uh, to go to. Also, Gary Deal of the Baker County Historical Society helped me a great deal because he did some wonderful sleuthing to find <coughs> old articles from Baker City newspapers. Uh, Historic Newspapers Online, another, another website that if you want to find out about what has been going on in this state, but if you have family in different places, they can tell you for cities and counties where those newspapers were. I, I got into the New Northwest, which was Abigail Scott Dunaway's newspaper, and got a lot of information that way. Also, um, the Hermiston Public Library, the Rotary Club of Wallawa County, Wallawa Public Library, Enterprise Library, um, definitely Rich, Cheryl, and Casey here of the Giuseppe. And finally, I'd like to thank Samantha S uh, Swindler, a reporter for the Oregonian who just got me, uh, got a hold of me about two and a half weeks ago, and we did a story and it came out um, election night. Um, it's on Oregon Live. You just put Abigail Scott Dunway in and there's an article about her and there are quotes from me and from her great-great-granddaughter, uh, Sancha Abbey. Sancha, Sancha Dunaway Abbey. <laughs> okay, this is uh, the second part of the talk that I gave earlier about Abigail. Um, she actually was the first cousin of my husband's great-great-grandmother, 
Almedia Scott, who resided in uh, Siskiyou County most of her life, although they all came out on the trail in 1852 and ended up in Lafayette, Oregon. And so that is the connection, and it was a fluke because Mike just started doing some genealogical research, and he said, I've always known there was this fire brand that my, that my mother talked about up in Oregon, and I don't know who, you know, who she was, and we found out. So, this is a photograph of Abigail. Um, I'd like to just give some highlights of her life and see if we can just move through this first slideshow very quickly. Um, Okay, first of all, um, I've just mentioned that she was a wife and mother, uh, married to Benjamin Dunaway. They had six children, one of them they lost uh, at a very early age. Uh, her husband was disabled um, in a freight wagon accident uh, permanently, and so he ended up only being able to do part-time work, and also was probably one of the first house husbands of that era because he stayed home and helped her raise those kids and did a tremendous job and they all got to work in the newspaper. They learned how to run a press, they learned how to distribute newspapers. It was really exciting. So I'll just uh, quickly mention this is Dunaway Elementary School. I attended it um, as, a, as a young person and saw this portrait of her and I don't remember, I, mean, I was very young, I didn't ask questions, and nobody really talked about her, so I kind of always had this haunting wonder about what, who is this person. <laughs> so moving on, uh, oops, wrong one. Uh, this is just a quick uh, shot of her signing the proclamation before the vote um, in 1912, and that's Governor Oswald West. Now, they came over to the Oregon Trail, and you can get a glimpse in the far right corner that uh, they started independence or outside independence, although the family had moved from parts of the Midwest. I mean, they'd been first in Kentucky, and then they went to, um, can you see me okay? <laughs> okay, they went first to Kentucky and then to Illinois, and spent years in Illinois, and then, um, her father's, her, her uncle, her father's brother was the one that wanted to get, you know, a wagon team together and get going, and so they, they left. Even though her mother, Jane Rolson, Rolson Scott, had just given birth to her ninth child within a year, and she was not well. Okay, I'm just saying that, I'll give you a hint. Um, so anyway, they left Independence, came across the trail. Um, at Fort, uh, let's see, Fort Laramie, um, they lost, because of the cholera epidemic, they lost, the, they lost her mother. And then her brother was drowned outside, um, outside Fort Boise, between Fort Boise and Baker, you know, Baker City. Um, and so it was, uh, that was just their story, you know, a, tra a tragic one. However, she had been, she was 18, she had been assigned to write um, a diary of the trail, you know, of the trip, which she did. Her father insisted that they keep records. So actually she sprinkled some of her poetry into that record. Uh, she talked about, you know, she wrote a couple of poems and a eulogy, of course, you know, for her mother and brother. And so that book actually became the first book that was, um, that was published in the Oregon Territory. Captain, Captain Gray's Company is the name of it. Okay, so moving along, uh, there it is. And then shortly thereafter, after she got into um, Lafayette and got settled with her family, uh, she became a teacher. And you have to understand that she never went beyond the eighth grade with education. She was self-taught. Uh, she, the family read books, um, you know, just all the time and, and had just family discussions of books, which was very common in that time period. And so uh, she set out to have a small boarding school with her sisters and brothers and then other kids that had come out you know, on the trail to Lafayette. So she did that for about a year and a half. Um, this is a picture and this is, this is, I haven't changed this, this is the Dunway family, although 
She's the Scott in the family, but this is the Dunaway family. That's her husband, Benjamin, and the children. Um, that's her husband, and here we are uh, when she became the editor of the New Northwest. But I'll just explain, getting to that point, because I want to move quickly beyond this, is that before she became a newspaper editor, she had a millinery shop. It started in Lafayette. It was moved then to Albany, Oregon, because that was actually the first territorial capital before it was moved into Salem. And so, you know, there were obviously a lot of people residing in that area, a lot of women who wanted to have, you know, their hats spiffed up and whatever, so she had a millinery hat, millinery shop there. And it wasn't until later that she moved the millinery shop to Portland. The key about the millinery shop was that it was like a lady's underground in that she was able to glean the stories of women and their travails on the trail and then in the settlement period, the early settlement period, you know, of the Oregon Territory. I mean, she learned a lot about, you know, how much, you know, how long they worked. I mean, they worked, you know, 14 to 15 hours a day, never got a rest, constantly having babies, um, you know, had, had no right to property, you know, no right to property. <laughs> that didn't come along until later. So anyway, she was very much, you know, it was all part of her blood at a certain point. I mean, she'd seen her mother and what happened to her mother. And so, um, she decided, <laughs> she was kind of an upstart, she decided, well, it's time to think about publishing a newspaper. And so, in the house that they bought, or I think initially they rented, but they bought eventually, in Portland, um, they had um, the, the press, in the, in the basement of the house, they lived in the upstairs of the house. And this was, um, this was a wonderful thing. And I think if you, any of you have time to go into historic newspapers online, you'll see that it wasn't just about women's issues. I mean, she covered the gamut of what was happening in the territory, in the Northwest, as well as events both in nationally and globally. And so it was quite, the, it was quite an experience. Okay, so once she got that going, um, people called on her to give speeches, and she actually got to give a speech in San Francisco at a, one of the first women's suffrage conventions. And that kind of taught her that she could do this, and she could get out and give, you know, give talks and be, you know, be part of the, be part of that whole experience. So. Judy. Mm -hmm. Was there a paper based in Oregon City or Portland? Or um, the paper was based in Portland because she had moved into Portland, and so you know she had you know she had the press there. Uh -huh. I think I've gotten to probably most of what. Here's a you know this is just a one page of it. It was about it was a four page paper, and I know because I was always able to find you know when you have to go into it digitally, I was able to find. The second page, which was where she had her editorial comments and where she wrote about her campaign travels. And so I just go from page two to page two to page two. And it was it was kind of it was fascinating. Okay, I can leave it at that. Um, but actually she got started pretty pretty quickly on the lecture tour and on you know just going out to meet with people. And her original supporters were churches. I mean, I think that's very interesting because, and I'll tell you in a moment, the Presbyterian, the Congregationalists, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, <coughs> Nazarenes, the Christian churches were all part of her, you know, her effort. And she would meet ministers on the train and talk to them about what she was doing. And her whole attitude was one of civility and propriety. Um, one thing you never saw in, in, the, in the experience of Oregon, Washington, and Idaho that I know of, I've never heard of it, was any protest, um, certainly not violence. There was nothing like that. I mean, it was very, you know, they went about it very quietly, carefully, and went, to, went out to the people, you know, to try and reach people, um, not only in the cities, but obviously in the hinterlands as well. One thing I wanted to do and I didn't do 
is um, I wanted to just read a little excerpt from her poem that she wrote that was published in the Oregon Argonaut, which was an earlier newspaper, the one, one in the territory. And this was when um, her farm, their farm burned, and they lost their farm. Tis night, slowly the orb of day <coughs> passed through his gold-fringed curtains, grand and faded from our view. The queenly moon with face serene now, now mounts her silver chariot and soars in majesty through canopies on high. No sound is heard, save now and then the note of some sweet bird or the common croak of tree frogs call as happily he chants his evening melody. And it's called the burning forest tree that goes on to describe that whole experience of the forest burning. Um, and so she was an amazing writer, and I, and you know, it came across in her newspaper. It came across in you know almost anything you could pick up of her work. Um, I'd like to mention though that at this stage, I want to. I think I'm going to move to the other talk. Right. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Okay. This is the second one. I'm going to have to scroll down. Okay. We were on the Oregon Trail earlier. What I wanted to do is show you this map, which is a little harder to follow, and I don't have my laser beam that I can point out. If you look in the far corner up here on the left, uh, part of Umatilla County, that's Umatilla. And you can see that one river that flows into Pendleton. That's the Umatilla River. Uh, she stayed in Umatilla a few nights, gave lectures, spent time in people's homes and went with her companions down that, that road in a freight wagon to Pendleton. And then from Pendleton, they went across Meacham, and then eventually got down to Baker, and came back up through Cove and Uniontown, and over to the Grand, back up to Pendleton, took a side trip to Walla Walla, and then got back to Umatilla. And the reason why Umatilla because Umatilla was a debarkation uh, point for steamships and for any ships coming up the Columbia because um, the portages beyond Umatilla were such so great that most people would not even attempt them. And so whenever, you know, out of Baker City when the mines you know, were shipping uh, gold and silver, they would go <coughs> up to Umatilla. And Umatilla was kind of an economic hub at that time simply because of the transportation what year was this, Judy? Well, this would, um, okay, about in the 18, late 1860s, early 1870s, okay? So I'm going to talk for a moment about our trip with Susan B. Anthony. Um, eight, Susan Anthony, B. Anthony came out in 1871, and they took a trip from Portland to Umatilla to Walla Walla. And I'm going to read, because I think this is so... Timely. It's just like, it's like she just, <laughs> like she's here with us. This is Susan B. Anthony. I know that the usual secret underhand opposition of the envious and jealous, which always has to be encountered by the faithful public servant who is engaged in conquering prejudice, has already assailed you. But tis nothing. It will soon exhaust itself. All you have to do is to work right along as the moon did when it was barked at. You shouldn't even stop to brush off the flies that light on the ox's horn. They can't stay there, try they ever so hard and long. That's Susan B. Anthony speaking at that point in time. So, <laughs> anyway, um, they traveled by steamship. I'm going to give you a little sense of this. I think I can stay here. And then, I'll, and now, then you can see that Okay, they left, they went by steamship to, from Portland to the Dalles, spent a couple days in the Dalles, um, and then continued on to Umatilla, and then by freight wagon up the Umatilla to Pendleton, as I mentioned. Always they stayed in local hotels or people's homes. On average, uh, she gave two to three lectures during her town stay, at, usually in courthouses, churches, hotels. Um, Abigail Scott Dunaway would give vivid descriptions of the landscape, the weather, 
I mean, she referred to the winds as the zephyrs that brought snow and then the Chinooks that came afterward. And I have a little, uh, does someone like to read this? Because I try to involve the audience a little bit. Is anybody else up to reading? November 17th, 1873, traveling from Uniontown to Baker City, had problems with their stagecoach. Quote, the laboring vehicle remained closed for one day when the stages changed time. We made the distance of 40 miles in snowy daylight, found dinner at Way Station, where the wind held high carnival with the freaky fickle frost king. On we went again. Lurchy lunge, smashy bang at nightfall, traversed a sloppy lane and a long bridge to the Western Hotel. Thank you. So, on that same trip, and I think that there's a slight, this was 1871, so I may have put the wrong date on that, but anyway, um, she had an interesting experience on the Meacham Road, and essentially they were riding in a stagecoach, there was a passing freight wagon, and they basically were locked together. I mean, they, they couldn't pass very easily. So the freight wagon actually pushed the stagecoach out of the rut it was in. And then they were able to continue on, which was very common. They, they always had these, these stories that went, went with every trip. Um, she mentioned, you know, she talks about the general jostling, bumping in stagecoaches, and that it was always very cold. Also, there's a very interesting story about her leaving Baker City uh, with her companions. Uh, they, they ended up with verdigree poisoning. Has anybody ever heard of this? Anybody? It's um, essentially what had happened. They stayed in a hotel in Baker City, and apparently the pot that was, I guess, that for their tea water must have had some granules of um, oxidized uh, copper, you know, on the inside. And this was not uncommon. I've re read about it now, and a lot of people would end up with this, and, not, and, and some people died from it. It could have very dire consequences, both physically and mentally. But she recovered from it. Uh, it set the party back for several days. They had to stay over in Union, Tam or in Union I and they called it Union Town, incidentally. When you hear Union Town, it's because that's what it was called in that time period. She was nursed by a Mrs. Hendershot, who was named the Clara Barton of Eastern Oregon. Um, and you'll hear more about Harriet Hendershot in a minute or two. She met numerous women in Union and the Cove. Um, they ended up being one of the most active suffragist groups that she had across the state. Don't ask me why, but it was interesting because they just seemed, and, I'll, and I think there are reasons, that they seemed to congregate in that area. And from there they moved on to Cayuse Station and had an experience with Indians and uh, before they left for Pendleton. And it was interesting because her comment was, and it wasn't, it wasn't racist, it wasn't you know, prejudicial in any way other than to say that the men were just sitting around and the women were doing all the work. <laughs> and so, and she was, and she had a sharp tongue. I mean, she didn't hold back, and she had a bit of a crusty, crusty nature to her. And so she would let, you know, she, she wouldn't say it to their face, but she would just comment. <laughs> so then they caught a stage back to Umatilla and the Dalles and returned to Portland. And this, now again, this trip took from October 25th to December 17th. And all in all, she probably was on eight eight or nine different stagecoaches or wagons, and then of course the steamship, you know, up and down the Columbia. So that's the way it worked. Judy, mm -hmm. how did she get in touch with Susan B. Anthony? Um, because she had met her and some other people at that Eastern, you know, when they came out to San Francisco initially, and, gave, and she was asked, because someone else was ill, and they asked her to get up and speak, uh, she made acquaintance of her, and she also, Kept, I mean, her letter writing was amazing. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's how it started. So I, I just wanted to stop here for a moment just to point out that this is a 1905 Women's Suffrage Convention. You can see the dress. Um, there are a lot of women in black. Um, there are also a lot of women in white. You know, the color of the suffragist 
And, I, and I've heard too, I've, I've looked this up, that the suffragette was a term that men tended to use for women, uh, kind of like the JCF. <laughs> and women, women preferred to have the title, I mean, or the, you know, the, the acronym, not the acronym, but the title suffragist. And so uh, the suffragists that, we, that I've come across in photographs were either wearing black or white. Now I know that green was another color, apparently purple, purple and gray, you know, but, but typically, at least in everyday wear, we see women in black and white. So moving on to, just to comment, that I've, I'm still searching a lot of newspapers and diaries. I'm hoping to get back to Eugene because the University of Oregon probably has the best collection of her diaries and journals. But we've discovered that, um, that she not only had sub, um, sub subscribers and suffragists in Malala, Alder, Enterprise, and Joseph, but they were friends and family of Jenny McCulley, um, who was married to McCulley, who was the cousin of Frank McCulley, who, basically was the mayor of Joseph and put up a lot of the buildings here and did a lot of other work in real estate and politics in the area. So I'll, I'll mention that um, just in passing, I have not found a reference yet to her actually stepping foot in Wallowa County. And I can understand that because she wasn't a wealthy woman. Um, she was a woman that lived, you know, from probably uh, subscribers <laughs> checks to you know one month to the next um, they were not wealthy and um, it would have been out of her way it would have been another you know to come you know by all of those means of conveyance and then to take another side trip you know over into Wallowa County would have meant a lot of time but I'm hoping I will still find out that she came here and there, there's a reason in that because at one point um, we did she lost um, her daughter in 1886. I was going to read the eulogy, but I think it will take too much time. But she lost Clara, who was, she was very, very close to, um, to uh, tuberculosis. And so after that, within a year, um, she sold the newspaper. Um, that was it. She was just, um, she, you know, I think she put all the work into it, and her family put all the work into it that they could. And so they sold the newspaper, and they ended up leaving Portland for a while, and they bought property east of Boise, um, actually in the area around Pocatello, and uh, ranched, you know, for about seven or eight years. And of course, they came back and forth, so I kind of wondered if she did that, if at some point she may not have come out to this area, at, you know, at, a, at that later stage. But that would have been in the late 80s, 1880s, and early 1990s. So there's, um, there are a couple of stories I'd like to tell about Baker City because I think, um, you know, it was interesting. <laughs> uh, the suffragists organized um, themselves, um, but with the help of Mrs. M. H. Eaton, who was a librarian in Uniontown and who circulated a petition in Baker City. In 1906, you know, we're fast forwarding ahead to closer to the end of this um, suffrage movement in, in the Northwest. They met at Meth the Methodist Church with Mary Chase, who gave a good talk on the suffrage uh, question, and this was reported in the Morning Democrat. In 1906, um, there was another women's suffrage meeting at the home of Mrs. Clemmer on 8th and Washington. Fifty names enrolled for the Oregon Equal Suffrage Association chapter. And, and what you'll see, and I found it in the ledgers, I was able to get into the ledgers in the Oregon Historical Society that were hand-penned by Abigail Scott Dunaway with all the names of the subscribers to her newspaper as well as subscribe people that, you know, wanted to be part of the equal suffrage movement. And there were probably 300 to 400 people, you know, in this region. And it just, you know, they were in little pockets here and there. They, there were people in Wallawa, I mean, Wallawa and, um, <coughs> which was then part of Union County, Wallowa and Elgin. And so, um, moving, I'll move along with this. Harvey Brown was the sheriff of Baker County and he ran for governor in 1906. His platform included women's suffrage. 
There was a letter to the editor in the Portland Oregonian in April 1906, which talks about the primary election in April. At that point in time, there was a primary in April and a general election in June. This person responded to the previous letter to the editor about thinking women. He referred to the writer with the masculine ideas as a typical woman suffragist, doesn't want to see his wife going to the polls in divided skirts and cowboy hat, prefers frocks, lace, and gloves, away with masculine women with a penchant for politics. And then there was another, um, another editorial that appeared in the Baker City Herald at the same time. In these days when the spirit of a greater Oregon is in the air, the state can ill afford to assume the handicap of woman's suffrage. And then this came from the Portland Oregonian. 200 Portland businessmen mounted a protest. Large, large majority of women in the state do not want it. And I was in quotes. Um, this, was, this is another way, that, another way we see how it played out. Uh, Mrs. Lackner, and I've heard some things about her. I mean, the people knew of the Lackners over there spoke um, at, the, at the Alpha Club. And she says, she said to the group assembled, women should abandon their business careers because their home suffers. Men, the natural breadwinners, are hurt by competition with their wives. And most women in the group sided with her. In the states where it's been tried, um, and this is what they were pointing out, Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah, Women who had availed themselves of the ballot were neither honest, wholesome, progressive, nor proficient. And I just thought, those words, those were the exact words. <laughs> Women are not designed for the rough and tumble activity of public and political life. And I know we've seen a lot of that <laughs> in the last year. Um, anyway, the topic of the club meeting, though, because this was a literary society, and the literary societies were very prominent in the small in the small cities and towns was Shakespeare, As You Like It, and Henry VIII. And I thought, again, that was just <laughs> prophetic. <laughs> so, um, moving on to Wallowa County. This is, I'm not going to read this right now, but it's a little clip from the Woman's Home Companion about comparing the way our mothers, at this point in time, this was 1912, how our mothers were as compared to us. And it was, it's kind of interesting though, I'll, if you can just glance at it, um, then I'll, here's the second part of it, you can read that. So now we get to talk about the women that comprise <coughs> the chapter of the Oregon Equal Suffrage Association. Um, and this was one of the women who was from Union County, uh, although she had close ties, you'll see in a moment, she had close ties with uh, people in this county. Uh, she was the wife of James Hendershot, as you can see, came to Oregon on the McCulley train in 1852. And, and I, you can see that she and her three daughters sailed around Cape Horn. And they settled in Cove, but moved to Union. And it was called The Cove, which was interesting. In, in all of the newspaper articles that I read about that time period, it was referred to as The Cove. And her husband served at the Oregon House and Senate. And there's Harriet. She's the woman that nursed uh, Abigail Scott Dunaway when she had her degree poisoning. And her and her companions too. Okay, so here's Jenny McCulley. Jenny McDonald McCulley. She again came out here on the McCulley train from Ohio. Um, and you can see she married William Asa McCulley in Lebanon. <coughs> and they moved, they were first in Cove, and they were there for quite a while, and then they moved over to Joseph. And I think I said this already, but again, uh, Wallowa County and Union County were all one county. It was all Union County up until 1887. Right? And her husband was a first cousin of Frank David McCulley. And he, a lot of people know about him. 
I mean, the, the ladies that I talked to here in the Historical Society could tell me quite a bit about, you know, the family and what impact they had on the area. I guess he was also instrumental in the, in the settlement of Lostine. But, you know, real estate broker, a lot of people came out here and got into real estate, of course. Uh, Mary McCulley Creighton, again, another McCulley, and one of the organ her husband was one of the organizers of the train. And she married John Creighton, uh, came from Indiana. Um, they ended up after Cove, because these people kind of went to Cove first, which I can kind of understand. It was it was getting settled faster, and it was, you know, not too far out of Baker City. And then um, they ended up on a farm near Prairie Creek. And I don't know how many of you know that the road between Enterprise and Joseph was named Creighton Lane. It was called that for a long time, and then apparently, you know, just became, you know, the Joseph Highway. <laughs> anyway, so she was the sister of Martin McCulley. And then we have Harriet Welch McComas. Now this is an interesting story because they weren't directly connected to, you know, the train, the, the train and to um, the Macaulay's. But anyway, she met her husband in Iowa, came out in 1862, which was quite a bit later, and they opened up a hotel in La Grand, um, or he did, and then she ended up coming around the Horn, which again was very common for women and their children you know, to get on a ship and come around the Cape, around Cape Horn instead of making that long trip across country. And then took a steamer to Umatilla, which we know, and married Abba McComas. And McComas was, he published the first newspaper in Union County. And Abigail Scott Denway had wonderful things to say about him as an editor. He, she really liked his, his work. He uh, was very factual, very, you know, she liked his writing. Um, then, at some point, and <laughs> we were all, I've got the historians here laughing about this because he traveled, he ended up leaving his newspaper behind in the hands of undoubtedly somebody else and traveled with a patent medicine show with Chief Charlie Whirlwind, who was part of the Umatilla tribes. Um, and uh, Marilyn Hulse explained to me from Malawi, she explained that he. Chief Charlie Rowland was buried over in Pendleton. And apparently Evan, you know, Evan was in um, Wallawa for a period of time. So we're trying to now track down more information because they have some additional information in their Wallawa History Center. So let's see where we are. <coughs> Evan McComas in Buckskin. <laughs> So you have to picture this person going from being a hotel proprietor <laughs> to being, you know, just <laughs> a newspaper editor to just, I guess, wanting to run away from all of it. Kind of an early hippie, maybe. <laughs> I don't know what he was doing, but there he is. Okay, so now we have Ella Hug. And this is really interesting. Notice that Ella Hug, Mrs. Charles Hug, had a millinery shop in Enterprise. This was in the newspaper in March, uh, March 15th, uh, 1912, before the election. But the, again, the connection, you know, the millinery shop and the fact that, you know, so much had come from, you know, that's where Abigail's origins were in her work. And I thought it was very interesting that there was that, that not just coincidence. And then this just shows that um, there was a large registration gain over 1910. However, here we go. This is, I, I know you're all waiting to see, okay, what really happened here? Well, this is all, these were all the different years that the bill was put up. I mean, or the, the vote was, you know, the vote was put up before um, the electorate in Oregon. And you can see that in 1900, it came very close to passing and then it slipped back again. Well, part of this was because Harvey Scott, the editor of the Oregonian, and the brother of Abigail Scott Dunaway, was vehemently, he and his, you know, his constituency, his newspaper followership, fell, you know, following, were, were opposed to um, suffrage. And he, he just went all out 
to oppose it. With cartoons, with um, editor scathing art editorials. I mean, nothing like what we have seen in the last year. I mean, let's face it, nothing. I mean, this was still very polite, and, <laughs> but people were, you know, clearly, um, you know, I, there were people clearly opposed to it, as you can tell. But by 1912, there was a group, um, and Abigail was not at the forefront then. She had been, she had had health problems, and she had pulled back. And there was a group of people in Portland who banded together um, with a coalition of temperance groups, which I, I will mention that Abigail did not believe in mixing those two issues. She thought that, she really felt that they needed to be kept separate in the eyes of the voters. And she, <laughs> she vehemently insisted upon that for a long time until some of the others just, you know, said, we've got, we've got to go a different route. Yes? So Judy, who got to vote then? Were these just the male, male the the men. Oh, yeah. or any man? No, any, well, men that were, any man in the territory, or in, at that point, this, we were past statehood, so any man could vote, yeah, as long as they were registered to vote. Uh, women had gotten, way back, way, women had gotten the right to property, married women had gotten the right to property back in 1878, and it was largely because Abigail Scott Dunaway and her contingent of people really lobbied the legislature seriously. And again, got you know a large following of people you know to go in the legislature. But anyway, the, the battle was it was the sibling was the sibling rivalry, you know, between her and her brother. And it was interesting because when they, as children, they were competitive. They were you know closer in age, and they were very competitive. But when they came out all together on the trail and they kind of went their separate directions. Uh, Harvey helped her family quite a bit because they were struggling. I mean, you had a husband who could, you know, who could not work more than part time. He actually worked in um, the state printer's office uh, for a while, and he also worked um, for the US Census Bureau, but it was always in a part time position. And, um, and anyway, Harvey did help them out. He made sure that they, you know, worked, you know, worked starving, but I mean, they did have a hard time, hard go of it. And so, um, but he had his constituency, his newspaper had you know, his constituency, and they, they battled. So that's, um, and then here's the suffrage amendment, you know, as it was written, 1912, and signed by Governor West. And finally, Abigail was able to vote Right before, not too long before she died. She died about a year later, but she got to vote. Well, I wanted to do one thing because I, um, I didn't pass these out before as people came in. I noticed there were people filling in and I didn't get a chance to, but I wanted to say that there were a couple of things that I thought were worth mentioning. And one was, um, I found this obscure website for the Center for Columbia River History out of Vancouver, Washington. <laughs> Uh, wish Washington State University has had a lot to do with this, but I think that they're not doing much with it anymore because of funding. I'm sure it's just a funding issue. But there's a story about Anna, uh, Umatilla, uh, who um, in 1914 were elected to office. And I'd like somebody that has good eyes to stand up and read this, if you would, because it's a great story. Treasurer, Bertha Cherry as recorder, 
Florence Ramil, Gladys Spinning, Anna Means, and Stella Palu to council positions. <laughs> they called it the petticoat government, and there's a, a delightful story about it for young adult readers that's in the library. Well, I know it was in the Hermiston Library, and I imagine we can get it over in one of our libraries, but it was a fun, it's a fun story to read. So um, I'm just about done, and I, I wanted to have Casey not only come down and model this beautiful hat, <laughs> which I mentioned, ask her if she would. Uh, this hat came from Carolyn Witte. Uh, Judy Wanch and Eric knows of it because I think you got to wear it, didn't you? Yeah. Well, it's now, you can wear it anytime you want to. <laughs> anyway, um, so this is the hat. This is the hat that I found. It's circa 1910. Uh, it's a very, very old hat, and it's starting the the weaving. Yeah, turn around. The weaving is starting to shed, you know, shred on the edges. So we're going to have to get it fixed. Could you get a little closer to the podium? Come, come a little closer. Oh, sorry. Are those red ostrich feathers original? Uh, is that I, I really, honestly, don't know. It's a hundred, it's a hundred over a hundred years old. Really, they did But it wouldn't. Yeah, it would not have. Um, it would not have been something that the suffragists would have worn necessarily because they tended to wear not so much color, but it could have. It could have been, just depending upon what was going on. It was a big event in Portland or somewhere. So anyway, she's going to read um, the closing remarks by Abigail Scott Dunley. The young women of today, free to study, to speak, to write, to choose their occupation, should remember that every inch of this freedom was bought for them at a great price. It is for them to show their gratitude by helping onward the reforms of their own times, by spreading the light of freedom and of truth still wider. The debt that each generation owes to the past, it must pay to the future. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is it. Um, I don't want to any questions, although I'll see if I can answer them. I know the, the research is spotty. <laughs> yes. Was it, I, I think I missed it, the big difference between 1910 and 1912 with that 15% gain to pass the amendment, was that because it was tied to the temperance movement or what was the transition? Uh, I think that they got, I think they strengthened their coalition, yes. And I think they've also got a lot better advertising out because the Oregonian was the major newspaper then and they were just blasting the pages with um, not, a, not only with the editorial comment but they had cartoons and they had all sorts of anti-suffrage, you know, information. And so I think, and remember, oh, and remember her newspaper died in 1887. I mean, she had to close it. She couldn't keep making it, making it go. Although there were other smaller newspapers that they never had the readership that, that, that the new Northwest had. And was there some philosophical or political transition? I mean, what was the awareness level of you know, why let women vote? You know, it's, it was so unconventional and there was so much opposition and it was all men voting. Was there some understanding? I came in late, I'm sorry. So maybe That's I okay. No, you did, this is a good question. I'm going to go back over to the other slide if I can. Yeah, if I can. Um, I'll show you the postcard. I think I still got that. Um, okay, there's a cartoon from the Oregonian. This is one that was in the Oregonian in in the earlier stages, but there were more that came later. There's Harvey, her brother. Does he look like a friendly guy? <laughs> I mean, he tried. Um, and there's another cartoon from the Portland Oregonian. What is a suffragette, suffragette without a suffering household? I mean, you know, and again, these weren't vicious, vicious things. I mean, they weren't like what we have witnessed, but they were nonetheless what was out there in front of people. <laughs> this is what I think was helping to turn the tide. See this postcard? This got out around. You know, they kept saying, okay, Oregon, come on. What are you doing? You know, we've got, we've got all these other states behind it. And so I think that the pressure of that definitely was part of it. Good question. What year did the other states pass it? Um, okay. I, I'm just trying to remember California, but Idaho was back in 1896. Wow. And now remember that remember the coincidence that Abigail and her husband and Willis, her son, 
bought a ranch in eastern Idaho. Mm -hmm. She was out there campaigning. She helped them get the vote. And then Washington was 1910. I think California was just maybe right after that, like 1911. It was very close. So they were like, where are you, Oregon? So, they, they, I was going to ask you, uh, so there were no jailings and, and that kind of uh, in Oregon? No, no, it just was not going that way. It was not run that way. It, it, it was not run as protest. It was run as, um, you know, high reason, high uh, ethics um, in terms of what her beliefs were. Um, it's really interesting. I talked to her great great granddaughter, Sancho, and the family is still situated in uh, around Polk County, around Salem and Albany, and they still. Um, you know, their family for generations has populated the Unitarian Church. Um, she just had very, she's a big, I can say, I think she was a very spiritual woman. <laughs> she had, you know, she had a belief that if they just kept working it, um, and they kept drawing more people into the process, it's just that she got old. She got very old, and there were other people that had to carry, you know, had to carry it forward. And I think one of the most prominent people in the in the final stages was a woman um, by the name of Lovejoy. And if you know anything about Portland, Lovejoy is a very common, <laughs> yeah, we say a street name, and you know, it's all over. Yeah. Rich? I can't help thinking, you look at that picture of all those women in those terrible dresses. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I can't remember the treaty, but one of the treaties in the East required the returning of women and children who had been captured by Indians. <laughs> and some 300, I think, were returned. Most of them against their will. The women did not want to go back to that. Yeah. Yeah. They were, they were, they said, and there were some it's quotes. They said, life, with, life in a teepee was tough, but you could kick the SOB out. <laughs> Where, <laughs> Uh, you know, you still you had to work hard, but women had more freedom in Indian society than mm -hmm. they did in uh, in Euro American society. Uh -huh. and I, I I think that Peter's question is still crucial. How do you get fifty percent of the men to vote for suffrage? I you know. <laughs> Huh? Yeah, nice. We're not all bad. <laughs> my question, frankly, was did they use the Grecian trick? Well, let's think about it another way, and that just in terms of numbers. Um, if they were living anywhere west of the Cascades, um, they needed votes. They needed votes in the legislature. They needed people voting, you know, for the eastern, you know, the eastern side of the state, the central and eastern side of the state in the legislature. That, that's another. That could be a very compelling reason. Would um, that have been also, but because there were fewer people in the West, so the West promoted suffrage. I mean, well, Wyoming's the first state, okay, right? Okay, another, another, another. If you go back, okay, it, this was post Civil War. Right. A lot of these families had come out of that era prior, you know, pre Civil War and during the Civil War, so they. They, they didn't want anything of that. They didn't want to be part of that. And the women, especially, you know, did not want to be part of it. They wanted, and I, I don't know, I don't know how they got their, you know, their husbands, their brothers, their, you know, nephews, and all of them, you know, to vote. But, but I, think, I think the Civil War had some effects on it, too. And I haven't read much about that recently, but I believe that that was another kind of issue. Dave, did you? Um, this would just all be state-based elections, though, right? State-based elections. Yeah, yeah. the national was until 1920. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, were there attempts to vote for president, nevertheless? Um, oh, or federal, federal. Well, offices? I know that I know that I, I know that uh, um, a number of people, including Abigail, tried to vote, and their votes were not. You know, they cast their votes. But their votes were put underneath the ballot box and mm -hmm. not counted. Mm -hmm. But no, they tried to vote. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. 
Judy, you said you had a theory for why the, the women of Northeast Oregon were, were strong uh, in, the, in the movement. Well, they came across the trail, you know? I mean, they had sacrificed, I mean, think about what they sacrificed, and they lost children, they lost, you know, their adult relatives. Um, it was just a period of immense sacrifice, and it was not an easy, you know, if I, I didn't read the whole burning, the burning forest tree poem, but, you know, this was a hard scrabble farm that they had. I mean, they had to go in and, and take out trees, I mean, in order to even, I mean, they, you know, it was wooded, a pretty heavily wooded area in Western Oregon. And I just think that's, I think that had to play into it. I think the women were incredibly strong. And the fact that they brought their, their stories, you know, they found someone who'd listened to their stories and weren't afraid to have their stories go forward in a newspaper, you know. And again, they were usually, obviously, confidential. They didn't, they didn't name names, but they did tell the plight of that that was a that was a rallying cry and a a way that it helped strengthen the women I think that were out there. So that's what I've always heard was the reason Wyoming went first. Yeah, Wyoming. Yeah, why Wyoming, Wyoming, Wyoming first because right. the, the the ranchman of Wyoming mm -hmm. demanded it. You're right. Okay. Any other thoughts or can we? Well, it's, it's after one if people have to go, and I'm sure you could um, would thank you very, very much. You're